Let's bow our heads for a moment. Lord, as we open your word now, we ask that your spirit would speak to us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in chapter 1 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel sees God's moving throne with all its inner workings and the cherubim beneath and the wheels and uh, uh, quite a complicated thing that he saw. Uh, I would be curious to see it from modern eyes and say, was that gear works or what was that he was seeing? But in any case, it was the stuff that makes God's throne move. And, and one of the cool parts about the description in there is there's wheels that always go straight forward and don't turn, but the throne can go any way it wants. It's like, wait a minute, how'd you do that? How do you go any way you want, but always the wheels themselves go straight? I don't know. Do you have wheels for left and right and wheels for front and back and these wheels? I don't know. No, just... Reporting what Ezekiel reported to us. Uh, there, there are things about it that are beyond Ezekiel's understanding. And, and I'm suspicious beyond ours as well. Uh, in, in chapter 2, uh, the voice from the throne on top of this moving mechanism says to Ezekiel, stand up and I'll speak to you. And again, interesting to me, it doesn't say I stood up. It says the spirit stood me up. But when God says, stand up, I'm going to talk to you. I guess you don't have much choice. <laughs> and there he is standing up. And God starts talking to him. Uh, chapter 2, he says, I'm sending you to the house of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 2 beginning in verse 6. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Israel is going to be to Ezekiel like a swarm of scorpions that he's living amongst. How'd you like that, Connie? <laughs> Some of us have experienced scorpions in a much too personal way here in Arizona. And, and, and God says to Ezekiel, they're going to be to you like a whole swarm of scorpions that you're living in the middle of. And, and it's not going to be easy or pleasant but you're going to be okay. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And, and briars and thorns. Anybody around here ever met a thorn in Arizona? <laughs> All the time. Uh, anytime I go outside and do any work in the garden or whatever, I come back with, almost every time, I come back with thorns in, in my fingers. Some of them so small I can't see them, but I can sure feel them. They brush on the cloth. I'm like, Whoosh! got one in there somewhere. Get the light just right. And, the last one I picked out, I had to get the light just right and tweeze it and pick that thing out. And I let go of it. And it, was, it drifted to the ground. It was so small. <laughs> so small. But it was still bugging me. It doesn't take very much of a thorn to bug you. Uh, and in Arizona, life is tough. It's tough for the critters and it's tough for the plants. And the plants put out the thorns to protect themselves from the critters. And he was going to live among a bunch of thorns. At least that's how it's going to be. They're a rebellious house, God says. But you're going to speak my words to them whether they listen or whether they don't. Uh, they are rebellious. But you, verse 8, hear what I say to you. Do not, rebellious, do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now, when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me. And, and he doesn't say an angel stretches out. He said, there was a hand. So here's this disembodied hand. It looks like something out of a cartoon. And it has a scroll of a book. 
So this hand, out comes this book to Ezekiel. Uh, and he spread it out before me. It was written on the inside and the outside. Uh, and it was lamentations and mourning and woe. Man, this sounds a lot like the book that uh, John sees in Revelation. It's not identical. But probably this story is part of the root of that illustration in Revelation. It turns out that in Ezekiel, there are more references from Revelation back to Ezekiel than there are back to Daniel. Yeah, I didn't know that either until one of my seminary professors pointed that out. And since then, I've been paying attention, and there's a lot of them. I didn't count them yet. <laughs> but there's a lot of references from Ezekiel that show up in, in the, the four beasts with the four faces. Yeah, that's from Ezekiel. And that shows up in Revelation also. Uh, so, chapter 3, verse 1. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate it and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Man, that echoes back into Revelation, doesn't it? Only the bitter belly doesn't come here. But, you know, it's, it's not 100% parallel, but it, it's sure echoing parts of it. Then he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and hard language, but to the house of Israel. And then dropping down to verse 7. But the house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. God says, I'm sending you on a tough mission, Ezekiel. They won't listen. I know they won't listen. But I'm sending you anyway. They're going to be like scorpions and thorns to you, but I'm sending you anyway. Uh, you're going to say what I tell you to say, and they're going to hear it. And when we're all done, God says, they will know there's been a prophet in Israel. Now, at the time, they might not have accepted that thought, but we now know that he was indeed a prophet. That God did indeed send him to Israel uh, to give them the messages that he wanted them to hear. So then he talks about how the Spirit lifted me up, verse 14. And took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to the captives at Tel Aviv, who dwelt by the river Kibar, and I sat where they sat, and remained there astonished among them seven days. Now, I don't know if that was still in vision or if that was literal. But if it's literal, God took him from Jerusalem, apparently, and transported him to Babylon and dropped him down in the middle of a Jewish settlement of captives over in Babylon. You see, Jerusalem has already been captured by Babylon a time or two, but the final destruction has not yet happened. But it's pending. And God is sending Ezekiel to talk to the Israelites about what's coming with that final destruction unless they change their ways. It will have come. It will happen. They will be fully destroyed uh, and it won't be good and it would be best if they listen but God says uh, they're not going to but we're doing this anyway we're doing this anyway I send you as, with the message of warning and if they listen good if they don't listen it's not your fault but if you don't tell them then it's your fault for not telling them so you give the message <laughs> you just give the message not, not your worry it's my worry whether they listen or not I'm sending you knowing they won't listen, but you go do it anyway. He was astonished for seven days. Yeah, I, I think if I had just been transported from Israel to Babylon by, by the Spirit, I might have been a little astonished too. Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian, their meeting and riding in the chariot together, ending with the baptism of the Ethiopian. And then the Bible says the spirit caught Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more. And Philip was found as a, at Azotus, which is a town miles and miles and miles away. That's where he finds himself next. God doesn't often do things like that, but, but Ezekiel may have had one of those. Where, where God moved him from one place to another. And drops him down in the middle of the people that are supposed to listen to him. He's shocked. They're shocked. He didn't say anything for a week. <laughs> he just kind of 
too, too stunned to, to know what to say. And then God came and, and said, here's what I want you to tell them now. Um, chapter 4, God says, you son of man, take a clay tablet and lay it before you and portray a, on it a city, Jerusalem. So he takes a clay tablet and he sets it down there and he draws the outlines of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, apparently, how, whatever he drew, it was sufficient for the people looking over his shoulder, thinking, what's this guy doing? To say, oh, that's Jerusalem. And then God says, I want you to lay siege against it. It's kind of like getting out your G.I. Joe toys. He's going he's gonna to demonstrate to them what's going to happen to Jerusalem. So he builds a heap or a siege mound. Uh, ancient days, they always put the cities on the top of the tallest hill around with a good water source they could access from the inside. Now, sometimes they had to tunnel down through to get to the spring at the bottom of the hill because the springs aren't usually at the top of the hill. And so many of these old cities have a, a tunnel that goes down through the, 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 the hill and then out to where the spring is. Jerusalem has some of that, uh, and Megiddo has a really nice uh, excavated uh, tunnel for their spring. Um, and when there's a siege, because the, the, the walls are up on the top of the hill, it's hard to attack the walls. And, and so they will build a mound around it. So you can get higher than the walls and shoot over the walls or so you can get up even with the walls and batter them with your battering rams. They, they had all these different ways of going about attacking the city up on the hill and part of it was the building of this mound. So uh, Ezekiel builds a little dirt mound around his clay tablet Jerusalem. And then he says, I want you to take an iron plate, chunk of iron, and put it as a wall between the city and you uh, and you're going to lay siege against that city. You are going to be the besieger of Jerusalem from behind your iron plate. Uh, and uh, they will understand what you're doing. The next verses, starting in verse 4, talk about lie on your left side for the iniquity of the house of Israel for 390 days. And then when you're done with those, switch to your right side for another 40 days for the iniquity of the house of Judah. And God also tells him in there, uh, let's see, verse 8. Surely I will restrain you so that you cannot turn from one side to another till you have ended the days of your siege. He's besieging Jerusalem for this 390 days plus 40 days. That's over a year. And most of it he's on his left side for the iniquity of the house of Israel, 390 days, and then 40 more on your right side. And God says, when you're on your left side, you can't move to your right side. I will not let you. It's part of the message. Your left side only. And any of you side sleepers? This is only one side. Can't roll over. No back, no other side. No, no, just glued to one side for 390 days. It could get a touch old. Could get a little, maybe even sore. <laughs> uh, but God says, we're, we're making a point. We're making a point here. And in the middle of this, verse 6, I have laid on you a day for each year. For the years of their iniquity, you do a day for each year. This is one of those places in Scripture where it talks about the day for a year. It's in the middle of Ezekiel doing the left side, right side thing uh, for the iniquity of Israel and Judah. Uh, and then, continuing on in verse 9 of chapter 4, take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. Spelt is a relative of wheat. Uh, put them in one vessel all together. Make bread of them for yourself. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat it. So while he's doing the siege and the lying on the left side for Israel's iniquity, he eats nothing but this. Same thing every day. And he gets to eat by weight 
each day 20 shekels. Now I looked that up once upon a time in the past and I got a little margin note that I've penciled in. That's about eight ounces of food. Oh, that's not much. That's not much. You shall also drink water by measure, a sixth of a hin. From time to time, you should drink it. Oh, any time during the day, you can drink from your sixth of a hin, but the whole day gets only one sixth of a hin. How much is that? That's about three cups. Depends on what you're doing, but that sounds a little short to me. <laughs> sounds a little short to me. What's God saying? Famine and siege rations. You live out in front of them what they're going to go through in the siege of Jerusalem. They're going to eat very little. They're going to drink very little. This is all coming to them. You're demonstrating to them what's coming. They're going to see that and know. And, and then in the following uh, chapters, God tells Ezekiel, does this seem a little harsh? This is my loose translation. Let me show you what they've been doing then, if you have any doubts. And God shows him the abominations committed by the priests and leaders of the country in the precincts of the temple, there with their back to the temple, worshiping the rising sun. You what? You what? All the other pagan nations worship the rising sun. Why do you think the gate of the temple faces east? So that when you come to the temple, your back is to the rising sun and your face is to the God of Israel. But here they are inside the temple with their back to the God of Israel and their face to the rising sun. God says, you think I didn't know that? <laughs> You might not have known that, but I know that. And he shows them all the other abominations that they had there. Uh, and, and there weren't just one or two. And so God says, uh, you guys are going out into captivity. Uh, it, it's not going to go well for you. Uh, chapter 5. <laughs> starting verse 1. You son of man take a sharp sword... Take it as a barber's razor and pass it over your head and your beard. Then take scales to weigh and divide the hair. Shave yourself with a sword. The whole thing. Hair, beard, the whole thing. With a sword. Anybody here want to shave with a sword? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I mean... <laughs> I was just in the barber shop and, and they do the trim job with a straight razor. And I'm glad they practiced that. Because <laughs> in, in a skillful hand, a straight razor works nice. But man, if you're off a little bit, <laughs> we, we, we can leave an awful gash if we're not good at this. And I'm pretty sure that with a sword, it's not going to be as easy as with a straight razor. Uh, and, and I don't know that Ezekiel's been practicing with a sword. Uh, it might go a little rough, but he'll get it done. And then weigh this hair, and a third of the hair you're going to burn in, in, the, in the middle of your besieged city on this clay tablet. You're going to burn up a third of that hair. And the second third of the hair, you're going to chop it with that sword. Chop it down, chop it down, chop it down, chop it down. And the third third, you're going to scatter to the wind. And God says, that's what's going to happen to Israel. A third of them are going to die from famine and plague in the city. A third of them are going to die by the sword. And the other third are going to be scattered to the four winds of heaven. That accounts for all three thirds in my estimation. <laughs> and it's not good whichever third you're in. It doesn't go well. That's what's coming to Israel. But God goes on to say, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to restore you. Way before this, 100 years and more, God says to Isaiah, I'm going to send Cyrus to take you back home. They haven't been taken into captivity yet when God says that. 
God's telling them his restoration plan before he's finished telling them the destruction that's coming. He's already telling them the restoration plan. That's so cool about God. So cool. He's got to tell them about the destruction. It, it, it's coming. It's, it, it can't be avoided. But before he gets done telling them about the destruction, he's already told them who is going to bring them back. The man not yet born by name, he names him. He's sending you home. That's cool. But when it actually happened, and they actually, the city was destroyed, and they were all dispersed. When it finally sunk in to all the Israelites, it took the wind out of their sails. They, they were left feeling completely hopeless. Like there's, there's nothing, there's no chance, there's no future. It's over, it's done. We're, we're basically dead, we're basically dead. Chapter 36, beginning in verse 22. 36, verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel. He's talking about restoring them to the land. I'm not doing it because of you, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. I'm bringing you back. I'm bringing you back. Not because you've been good. <laughs> Not because you earned it or deserved it or anything of the sort, but because of my name before the nations around, I'm going to do that. I'm bringing you back bringing you back. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. And it reminds me of the moment when God says, stand up and I'll talk to you. And the spirit caused me to stand up. <laughs> God enabled Ezekiel to stand up. And God enables his people to keep his statutes. You will be able to do it because I have delivered you. And that's built into the Ten Commandments themselves. I have delivered you from Israel. Therefore, you can now be able by my action to keep my commandments. Verse 28. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. I'm going to give you a new heart, a new spirit. I'm going to bring you home in the next chapter. Chapter 37 is the vision of the dry bones. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around. I, I guess kind of a drone eye view, passing by, seeing all these bones. And he said, behold, there were very many in the open valley, and they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now you're standing before the God of the universe who's talking to you. And when he says, can these bones live? 
the, the, the um, correct theological answer is, of course, you're here, you can do this. But these posts were so dry that even Ezekiel says to God, hmm, you're the only one who knows if that's possible. From his perspective, he couldn't get the courage to say, of course you can. So I'm guessing they didn't look promising. <laughs> Not promising at all. They were very dry. Very dry. When someone suffers a medical crisis and we have to do CPR on them, how long do we continue the CPR before we give up and say, it's not working? That's a tough question. Happened to my cousin who found his wife collapsed on the floor halfway to the bathroom in the middle of the night. He's a pharmacist. He's got his CPR certificate. He started working on her, called 911. He didn't quit working on her. He didn't quit till they got there and took over. But he said, Jim, she wasn't in there. I tried, but she wasn't in there. Ouch, you know, finally they had to quit. It was too late. I had her funeral. These bones are bones we would give up on. We'd, we'd, way before this point, we'd have quit CPR. We'd have quit CPR when there was still a body that just died. We'd have quit CPR. But these are not just a body that just died. It's already rotted and the flesh is gone. They've turned to skeletons, but not just skeletons. The skeletons bones have come loose and separated and they're not even skeletons anymore. They're just loose bones. Probably some of the bones have been drug around by animals and others, not even near the original companion bones. They're disassociated bones and really dry like a cow skull out in the desert that's been there for decades. Like really, really dry. Maybe even a little hard to tell what bone that was originally. It's so deteriorated from being out there scorching in the sun. Man, it'd be easier to start over with fresh bones, wouldn't it? Or somebody that just died and all you got to do is hit them with the heart paddles or something like that. But these bones are dry, 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 dry. And God says, can these bones live? Well, part of the obvious answer, I think, is for us, me and those bones, not a chance. Not a chance. No, no way. Absolutely none of us can touch that one. You, sir, know the answer from your perspective, but from ours, no, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And so, verse 4, God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Bones, hearing. Hey, if God says hear, then the bones hear. <laughs> I don't know how dry bones could hear. <laughs> but you remember the creation story. God says, let there be light. Corinthians puts a twist on it. I hadn't noticed until pastor used it in his sermon recently. And in Corinthians, it says, God caused the light to shine out of the darkness. 
He told the darkness, give me some light. Darkness doesn't do light. You put light there and it dispels the darkness. But darkness doesn't do light. Unless God tells it to. If God tells the darkness, give me some light, it gives him light. And when God says to Ezekiel, prophesy and say, hear the word of the Lord, bones. They're going to hear the word of the Lord. And God's word is powerful. And it will do what he wants it to do, even for these really, really dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied. And as I was, as I was commanded, sorry, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. This is bumper car bones banging against each other, going back to the skeleton they belong to. The whole valley is rustling and banging and clattering with bones, bumping into each other on their way to their proper spot. That's strange. <laughs> strange enough right there. They're still dry bones. But when God says, prophesy to the bones, hear the word of the Lord, they do what God said to do. And as I looked, the sinew and the flesh came upon them, and skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Uh, one of the translations I was reading, it says, the, the flesh grew on them. He, he saw it, come on. <laughs> There's, there's flesh, there's muscles, there's skin. You got bodies. You got bodies, but no breath. No breath. At that point, you have a valley full of bodies like Adam when God formed him from the dust of the ground in Genesis just before he breathed into him the breath of life. There's his body. That God just created. It's the whole thing. The skin, the eyes, the nerves, the muscles. Everything is there except the life. It's a pre-living but ready to live body. When we see bodies without life, they are post-living and they're not ready to live. They're not alive because something happened that caused life to cease. We can't make them live because of the problem that destroyed their life. But this is the other end of that process, just before life is given and the body is ready to live and full and complete and the whole valley is full of them. And the Lord says, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. When God says, prophesy to the breath, breath, wind, spirit, interchangeable, all the same base word in Hebrew, all the same base word in Greek also, uh, and breath and wind and spirit. We use the three different translations in English to distinguish what we think is the meaning of the original, but it's all the same base word, all the same base word, ruach. And God is saying, prophesy to the wind, come wind, or to the breath, come breath, spirit, come and give life to these and then he says, verse 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We ourselves are cut off. There's no hope for us, says Israel. 
But God just showed what the hope was for a valley full of dry bones. Really, really dry bones. Not a chance. Dry bones. But when God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones, they come together. And the flesh comes on them and the skin comes on them. And when he says again, prophesy to the wind and the wind enters into them, they come alive. An exceeding great army. Anything to learn from that? Yeah, there's some good stuff to learn from that. One is that God always has the solution before the problem ever hits. He knows how he's going to fix it before we ever break it. <laughs> he knows what he's going to do. We never catch him off guard, unprepared or unable. Can't do that. He's always got plan B for whatever comes along. And God has a heart for us to be restored. That's his real goal. His goal in allowing the captivity in Babylon was to get Israel to leave their wicked ways and come back to serve him faithfully. And one thing that the Babylonian captivity did do, it cured Israel of their idolatry. They might have taken one or two flings later, but they didn't last long because they would all look at each other and say, y'all want to go back to Babylon? I don't think so. Well, then let's knock this off, shall we? <laughs> let's not do this. Let's, let's, let, let's quit this. Uh, and and their, their habit of Sabbath breaking was, huh, not, I don't know if you want to call it fixed, because they went into legalism about the Sabbath big time, but they quit the overt Sabbath breaking. They, they did quit that uh, after Babylonian captivity. God was looking at restoring Israel to a healthy relationship with him. And that was his goal in allowing the captivity. And he already has that planned before he let the captivity happen. He's got the good outcome at the end already in mind. God can give life and hope to the most lifeless and hopeless. You can't be in a spot where he can't fix it. We can be in a spot where it looks to us that he can't fix it. And it looked to Ezekiel, there wasn't a chance for these bones. But there was. God could make them all live again. He can make them all live again. Uh, and he wants each of us to have that living, vibrant relationship with him. Uh, restored, renewed in his image. Walking with him each day and every day. And, and if you ever get a little discouraged, remember the dry bones. <laughs> Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And they heard the word of the Lord. And they did live again uh, by his grace and his command. Let's pray. Father, we look forward to the day when Jesus will come and will say to all the bones of his people, hear the word of the Lord. And those bones will live literally again forever in your kingdom. But from that day, from now until that day, may we each day receive that breath from you in our spirits, in our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.